I see you're there. Okay. Good stuff. All right, everybody. Welcome to uh, Stefan Schneider's PhD Defense. Uh, it's our first, the school's very first PhD, PhD Defense in, uh, uh, for our computational sciences degree. So it's a very big day for our school indeed. Um, I would like to formally welcome and thank uh, Dr. Mark Schmidt for participating as the external, uh, Faye Song um, as our non-advisory member, and we also have Dr. Lindquist and Dr. Kramer here uh, rounding out the examination committee. So we'll begin today with uh, approximately a 30 minute presentation from Stefan, followed by questions from the audience. And for those questions by the audience, if you could raise your hand, please, and then I'll identify you um, to ask your question so we don't have everyone trying to ask a question at the same time. Um, following the audience questions, um, if needed, we can take a small bio break and then we'll begin with the examination questions, starting with the external examiner then the non-advisory member, Faye Song, Dr. Lindquist, and then Dr. Kramer. And we'll have two rounds of questions. Uh, so if you don't get all your questions done in the first round, we, have, we will have a second round. Uh, any questions before we begin? Okay, I'm gonna go dark here and Stefan, take it away. Okay, awesome. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, today to me is uh, what I feel to be a celebration. Um, and I'm really happy to have friends and family and enthusiasts in the area here to celebrate it with me. It's not very often you get a group of people to talk about what you've been working on for three years. And so it's just, it's just an honor to be here. And so um, I'm excited to get started talking about my work on deep learning approaches for animal re-ID um, for the University of Guelph. Uh, okay. Um, so as Joe alluded to, um, I'm uh, defending for the computational sciences program at the University of Guelph. And so in their words, this program is the opportunity for a student to study computing within the context of another discipline to commensurate with the student's interests and career goals. And so students entering this PhD program perform research that bridges computer science with at least one other discipline. And so I'll be defending my work, focusing on my interdisciplinary work for computer science and ecology. Uh, so animal re-ID, that's what this is all about. Um, animal re-ID has a whole slew of use cases um, of which um, we'll talk about a few of them. One of them is population estimates. So population estimates essentially provide a snapshot of ecosystem health. We consider a metric known as diversity, which is essentially the um, proportion of the different abundances of the species within an ecosystem. And this gives us insight into the trends of trophic interactions and overall population dynamics. Essentially, it's necessary for our understanding of sustainable practices and protection of endangered species and ecosystems around the world. Uh, and this is done through some a mechanism known as mark and recapture, where um, we sample from a population, we mark or identify the individuals, we release them, we then resample from the same population and based on the proportion of individuals that have been seen versus unseen, we have an overall estimation of the um, population size for that area. Um, it's also useful in the realm of ethology, also known as animal behavior. If you want to study long-term animal behavior, you have to be able to re-identify the animal individual. And there's also some commercial applications in fisheries, as well as something cute like a dog door detector to make sure it's actually your puppy that's coming home. Uh, so traditionally methods for animal re-ID are done through tagging and scarring. Um, and we do this because it works. Um, it has moderate to high reliability. We'll go, we'll capture individuals, we'll put a collar on them, an earring on them, a sticker on them. Um, but this has numerous disadvantages, including that it's expensive, it's laborious, and it's ultimately invasive to the animal. Uh, we know that the pattern on a monarch butterfly is responsible for sexual selection. So if we're slapping a sticker on the side of it, what is that actually doing to the creature itself? An alternative approach involves using camera traps and video. Um, it has advantages because it's lower costs and less invasive to the animals. However, there's multiple disadvantages, including low to moderate liability, depending on the species. It's laborious to analyze. It's typically a grad student looking over tens of thousands of images. Um, they operate on extremely long time scales. By the time that you decide to go out, set up your camera traps, make sure they work, leave them out for months to years, retrieve the SD cards, analyze them using a human, 
building a report and then submitting the report, it's on the time scale of years. Um, and so if you try to make meaningful policy decisions on that time scale, it's very difficult. Um, and ultimately, they are also subject to human judgment bias. So the question is, can we eliminate this human judgment bias? Can we improve upon the overall inefficiencies and can we increase the application of animal re-ID from images and video? And so I set out to prove that deep learning methods for computer vision can re-identify animal individuals from images with superior accuracy when data is available in comparison to previous computer vision techniques. And by doing so, I push both academic disciplines forward by testing the capabilities of modern computer science methods within the unfamiliar domain of ecological data and demonstrating its ability to solve previously intangible ecological problems. And so embarking on this journey at the start of my PhD, there's a number of unanswered questions that had to be solved. Um, the first one was what has actually been done before? No one had actually made a chronology or a history of animal re-ID and computer vision methods. Is there a trend in, this, in these methodologies and their performance? Um, can we quantify even the number of animals from ecological data? So ecological data is very different from the traditional computer vision test suites that we use to train models on. So can it even function in this environment? Can we classify species from camera trap data? Can we localize species? Can we actually identify where they are within the image? Um, can we re-identify an animal individual considering a single image as a reference? And so the single image there is key. And then lastly, can this be applied to a real world application? And so this is taken from a work that I published in Methods in Ecology and Evolution that um, um, provides a chronology of the history of animal re-ID using computer vision. And so as early as the 90s was the first approach using what is known as feature engineering. And in blue, that denotes the history of it using sperm whales, cheetahs, whales and dolphins, marbled salamanders, and onward. And then starting from 2014, there's been this shift in the literature focusing on machine learning methods. So what is feature engineering and what is machine learning? And how does this actually all work? So feature engineering, when we're solving these computer vision problems, we have pixels. We have RGB values between 0 and 255 that we often normalize between 0 and 1. We'll clean and transform those values. We might brighten the image. We might remove the background that's irrelevant. And then we'll come up with some custom feature extraction algorithm. So let's say we're trying to identify cheetah. We might look for design an algorithm that looks to count black spots on a yellow background, for example. We'll then train a model or use a model to determine, okay, six spots versus eight spots. This is Sam the cheetah versus Fred the cheetah. And then we gain insights into how that might be applied for ecological purposes. And so there's a robust history of this for all kinds of species. Uh, one of my favorites is whale sharks, which borrowed um, an algorithm from astronomy where they looked at triangulation patterns in the night sky to identify constellations they've seen before. And they used that same algorithm on the white spot patterns of the backs of whale sharks um, and was able to identify individuals with success. And there's a complete history of this published um, at the description there at the bottom. So if you think back to that chronology, there was the blue uh, feature engineering, but then there's this transition to those pink values, which was the machine learning models. So what is machine learning exactly? Essentially, we're taking out the middleman. No longer are we customizing these feature extraction algorithms, but we're allowing this computational structure to learn those feature extractions based on example data's data from input image to output classification. So in the case of individual re-ID, we would have pixel values here coming in. We then pass it through the network structures, which are a series of weights that correspond to activation values that then are into our output classification of individual. And so we're no longer hard coding these feature extraction algorithms, but allowing the system to learn through large amounts of data. Um, yeah. So um, since we're specifically focusing on computer vision, uh, there's been an evolution in the architectures known as convolutional neural networks, which allow us to look at the spatial similarity within an image. You can imagine there's little sliding windows that go across the image that garner information from a surrounding area. And this allows us to look at collections of lines and edges and colors. And so these networks are in layers. And so from collections of lines and edges of colors, you can then look at collections of those that make the shapes of ears and noses and eyes. And then the collection of noses, ears and eyes can give you insight into what the individual might look like. So this replaces the feature um, engineered approach, if successful. Um, so CNNs dominate um, the computer vision problem. In 2012, Krzyzewski released uh, a paper 
using CNNs on the ImageNet data set, which has tens of millions of images in 10,000 plus classifications. And they had a 7% increase in accuracy over the previous best. This is a generational improvement. Um, and ever since then, um, CNNs have dominated the computer vision and literature. Um, now, CNNs are conditioned on returning one classification for a given image. So if there's Sam the cheetah there, great. If there's Fred the cheetah there, great. But if there's both Sam and Fred at the same time, the system will get confused. Um, and so a way around this is uh, methods known as object detection, which allow us to localize objects within an image. And there's multiple methods for this, including YOLO, um, single shot detection, and faster RCNN. So this goes back to our question. We were interested in, can we quantify animal numbers from ecological data? And so we're gonna be using convolutional neural networks to do this. And so we have a domain, and this is sonar images off the back of a trolling boat in the Amazon River. And so the question is, can we count the number of fish and the number of dolphin? And so this is a relevant ecological question. It's relevant to fisheries. Um, there's scientific questions about fish populations relative to shade. Um, it seems like 10 years ago at this point, but last year, one of the main stories of the year was that the Amazon rainforest was on fire. So how that actually relates to the fish and dolphin populations is an ongoing scientific question. And lastly, um, this is relevant for poaching. Um, and so we were able to successfully train a machine learning model to quantify the number of fish, which are these speckles in the sonar image, um, into an accuracy of plus or minus 2.1 fish and 0.1 dolphin per image. Uh, so how did we do this? So when I say ecological data is atypical, um, there's perhaps not a better example than this data set. Uh, this data set had 143 total images. Um, when you're training deep learning models, they're in the scope of tens of thousands to millions to no exaggeration, billions of images. And so when you're trying to use this computational tool in this domain, you have to be creative. And so one of the ways that we tackled this problem was uh, dividing the data into a 15, 85% train test split, taking those 15% images, which is 20 images, breaking them down into their components, which was the background, the individual fish and the dolphins, and then providing image augmentation to recreate synthetic images using those components. And so we can actually map how synthetic data improves performance. And so considering fish, if you have no synthetic data, the, the model is unreliable. 143 images is, is just not enough. Um, and so as we increased our synthetic data, we can actually map how the fish, um, the mean squared error for the fish um, abundance improved. And the same with dolphins. Uh, at no synthetic images, just totally unreliable. But then around 5,000 images, it caps at the 0.01. Error. So we can count. This is great. Uh, so the question is, can we classify species from camera trap data? And so this involved a partnership with Parks Canada and the University of Calgary, an individual named Saul Greenberg, um, who is the um, lead programmer on an annotation tool known as time lapse or camera trap images. And so we had 89,600 images of 55 classifications from 36 locations. Um, and so I just want to prime the machine learning people here. What, what might happen with 90,000 images from 36 locations? What inherent biases might be created? Um, and so this was an opportunity to test the capabilities of deep learning systems on real world ecological data. And just to show, so this is what ecological data, camera trap data looks like. It is very unconventional to what you would see in a standard testing suite for computer vision models. We have a snowshoe hare here who's camouflaged in with a background. We have a lynx looking directly at the camera where maybe from the 90,000 images, we would have five perhaps of this exact photo. Um, we have a cougar here totally camouflaged in in the background and then a bear in uh, not exactly an atypical pose, but a funny pose as it is shedding and um, showing its territory. So this is um, what a breakdown of an ecological data set looks like. And this is a problem for multiple reasons. Uh, the first is inherent class imbalance. Essentially, if you would just train a model to best um, predict what species is within the images, it would be biased to select from these like seven most dominant classes, which include elk, grizzly bear, no animal, mule deer, snowshoe hare, deer, and wolf. From a high level perspective, you can actually think of this as if you were at a lecture and this was the proportion that a professor spent on the material for the course, but then on the test itself, everything was equally fair game. How would you feel in trying to memorize everything that way or learn everything that way? Um, the behavior is similar. 
from an ecological perspective, this is also a problem because the species that we care about are often those that are underrepresented, such as a bobcat here. This is, these are the species that are endangered. These are the species that are rare. These are the ones that we're interested in to make sure that we quantify them correctly. So we have to be able to solve this problem. And so one of the methodologies that I introduced in this Parks Canada paper was a novel ratio selection technique, where essentially every class is given a proportion relative to the max number of the class, um, max number of images for the um, largest class. And then there's a lottery essentially where uh, for each- Excuse me, Stefan? Yeah. Stefan, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. I can't hear anything that you've said for about the last two minutes or maybe more. I don't know what's happening. Can you indicate if you can hear me, please? Wave or something? Oh, yeah, you can hear me. I can see you, but the sound just dropped out about two or three slides ago, and I've been trying to figure out what's wrong. Um, and I have no idea what it can, might be, but me? I can't hear you. So can you hear me? Do you have any way of troubleshooting this? I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but I would like to hear your presentation. Oh, shit. Um... Everyone can hear me, right? Except for him, just to confirm. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, May I suggest you phone in on one of the so on the phone numbers? You can e if you need to. You can send me an email if you need to send me a message because I can't hear a thing that you're saying. Just so you know. Maybe he should sign out and sign um, back in. I'll send him an email here as well. I don't know what it could possibly be. Okay, great. Everyone else can hear. It must be. Something on his end. <sighs> Realities of Zoom defenses. Uh, Joe, should I go back two, three slides, or what do you think? I, I think you can probably proceed, given that he's your uh, on your advisory committee. Um, yeah. Being mindful. Sign out, then back in. Connect <laughs> via the phone. Okay, I'm gonna try and do that. Uh, I'm gonna have to move my physical location. So keep Stefan, you keep going. I have seen some of this before, and um, I'll do what I can. Uh, I guess I leave that up to you, Joe. What do you? Okay. I'm just. I just wanted to send him the uh, phone details here really quickly again, so he has them, right and easy. Okay. So I think um, being your advisor, he's comfortable with your presentation. So I think um, the presentation is really more for the audience members and the, the remainder of the examination committee. I, I suggest we continue with the defense and then, or with the presentation, and then loop back in after your your presentation's done. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, so we have this problem of class imbalance when working with ecological data. And so I introduced a novel ratio selection technique, which essentially looks at the proportion of the different classes and selects those that are underrepresented more frequently. Um, when those are selected, there's a heavier image augmentation placed on it to prevent overfitting. Um, in addition, um, what we found, so, and yeah, so our results, for the model were extremely promising. We get 96% accuracy re-identifying a species from camera trap images. This is great, celebration. Um, but we wanted to test this more thoroughly. And what happens was when we took it to different backgrounds that were not seen during training, the performance dropped dramatically um, to around 69% or 71% if you considered an ensemble of the models. And so we've essentially I propose that everyone reporting results in this discipline, um, make sure to report both from your trained location as well as untrained location, because a lot of ecological studies just report this number and people don't understand without at least having a thorough understanding of the field of machine learning that these biases can inherently exist. Um, I believe I have a solution to this problem. So ask me about it at the end because it didn't make it into my thesis, but I'm excited to talk about it. Um, we also provide uh, recommendations for ecologists for how, when they use deep learning systems, the performance might correspond to the number of images they provide, including 500 images, 750, and 1,000, being respective to 75, 87, and 97% accuracy. Uh, we can plot this where we have the mean number of images represented of the recall, which you can consider accuracy, um, where it's highly volatile, 
at the low image space, but as you get around to a thousand images, we kind of um, maintain it around 97% accuracy. Okay, great. So we can classify um, species from images. So the question is for re-ID, we actually want to be able to crop the individual out of the image. If you have just this whole image, there's a whole lot of noise. And it becomes very difficult to re-identify a gazelle here, considering that there's six on this image. So we need to get this gazelle directly out of the image. And so one of the ways to do this is using object detection, which I talked about previously, um, which involves two techniques known as faster RCNN or YOLO which is a form of multitask learning where we're not only outputting the result of a species, but also the X1, Y1 coordinates for the bounding box around the object of interest. In this case, it would be an animal. And so when I published a paper on this, no one had ever done this before. People were still focusing on single classification output from camera trap images, and they were doing multitask learning considering um, age and sex, but no one had actually been able to quantify multiple species within an image before. Um, as well, a contribution, I manually annotated 4,432 images from this um, gold standard snapshot Serengeti data set in order to do this analysis and project it forward as a metric, as a benchmark test suite for, ecologi for ecological machine learning studies moving forward. Um, so just to take a step back in terms of ecological applications where we are right now, Assuming these behave properly, which they do, the results can be extrapolated from camera trap data to anonymously collect information related to interspecies cohabitation, what species are occurring with whom, travel direction across your camera, and how these values change seasonally. Um, with training of additional classifications relative to sex, age, youth versus adults, stance, you could start training machine learning models to be able to pull out information related to family and community dynamics automatically from camera trap data. Okay, so we've been able to successfully extract animal individuals from camera trap data. So now we're actually on to the task of re-ID. Um, so re-ID from um, that history diagram I showed at the very beginning has been tackled before for animal individuals. Um, Carter et al. had the first paper that I've seen um, where they looked at the um, used feed forward neural networks to look at the shell pattern of green turtles off the coast of Australia. Um, Freytag et al. in 2016 used AlexNet, a simple network for chimpanzee faces. And then Brust et al. did this process that we're talking about where we use YOLO, we crop out the face of an image, we pass it through a neural network. The problem with these previous techniques is that they're only relevant when you have a catalog of large number of images for every animal in your population. Essentially, neural networks operate by having a multiple choice test at the end. Which animal is it from one of the number of training examples that you've had? And for any realistic ecological purpose outside of a national park where you know every individual, this is totally unrealistic. You don't have a catalog of every individual and you're unable to obtain that. And so, we have to find a different way. And so an alternative way of trying to do individual re-ID based on a single image, as in you have one image of an individual crossing in front of your camera, is known as one-shot learning. And there's a, met um, a method for doing this that involves something called Siamese networks, where you take two input images, you pass them through a CNN, you then merge the activation values of the last layer, you then pass those through an additional scene or um, neural network, which then produces a binary output of one or zero as to whether or not these input images were similar or different. Um, and that sounds complicated, but this is actually an extremely old idea. Uh, from 1993, um, it was introduced to detect signature forgeries. So when you're signing documentation, um, this has been a technique that's been used to detect whether or not your signature was yours or not. Um, since then, there's been an improvement to the training mechanism of similarity comparison networks. One is known as the triplet loss network, where we're not only considering similar dissimilar pairs, but we're considering a triplet of an anchor image, image of an individual randomly selected, a positive image, so a second image of the same individual, and a negative example, so an image of an individual that is not the same as your anchor image. And we want to minimize the similarity and then maximize the distance between the negative distance of these values here at the end of our network. And so this was introduced by Shroff et al um, through a network they called FaceNet, which on this data set called YouTube Faces of around 1600 people gets 95% accuracy. And so a note just on training for ML engineers here, this is what the loss function looks like. We take the mass, max of the distance of the anchor, considering a positive image minus the distance of the anchor to the negative image plus a margin considering a max of zero. 
And essentially this is a form of curriculum learning, you could think about it, where you're trying to do some form of selection to an example that the model is just on the edge of understanding. And so we try and select triplets where this value here is just less than the margin. This is called semi-hard selection. And then image augmentation is used throughout and is shown to be extremely important, especially relevant to Octopus, which we'll talk about. So I did something totally new here that had never been done before. Uh, we think back to the feature engineering approach. We construct these very specific algorithms to try and determine the, the spot pattern from cheetahs. Um, and kind of thrown that out, I'm going to use a single construct. I'm going to use these similarity comparison networks to try and do re-ID of humans, chimps, humpback whales, fruit flies, and Siberian tigers. The exact same methodology for all of these different species. Um, this is a way of testing the generality of this methodology and testing its capabilities in a domain that pushes its boundaries, such as fruit flies. Um, of note here, uh, it's important to realize that not all data sets are created equal. So for example, the humpback whales, we have 9,000 images of 4,200 humpback whales. That's an average of 2.1 whales um, or images per whale um, versus the fruit fly data set, which has 24 uh, or 240,000 images of 20 fruit flies. So when you're looking at these accuracies, it's really important to realize the data that we're able to create the results. And so this is the data um, and what it looks like. This is the human actors data set. We have a chimpanzee data set. Uh, we have a fruit fly data set. We have a humpback whale fluke data set, and then we have a Siberian tiger data set. Um, so this is the results, considering similarity comparison networks where you have a single image to verify the accuracy of an individual. And it's really important to take that home. Uh, there's a lot of numbers here, but really all I wanna show is that this is Siamese on the left, this is triplet on the right. We have our different data sets that we worked with, and the triplet loss network outperformed the Siamese loss, loss network in every circumstance. Um, just of interesting note, um, ResNet had the best map at five, um, considering all the models, which was interesting. Okay, and so this is what the output might look like. And so you'll have um, the model, or you'll have the ground truth name at the top here on the x-axis and the model output on the y-axis. And so it's two pictures of Sandra the monkey, and then the model says that's the same individual. Two pictures of Sandra the monkey, and the model says that's the same individual. Uh, this work um, was recognized and inspired uh, an invitation to a camera trap symposium at Google and Mountain View, which was really great to attend a conference that people had actually read my papers at, which was very exciting. Um, and then also um, an entire workshop, which I was the chair of at WACVE 2020, where we had submissions from literally all over the world, from Japan, China, Finland, Australia, United States, Canada, um, all enthusiasts of using deep learning for animal re-ID and so many just like creative projects looking at all different kinds of species. And so the question was, can we actually do this in practice? And so Stefan Lindquist, who <laughs> uh, um, is uh, from the Department of Philosophy and is an absolute enthusiast for the um, prospect of octopus intelligence. Um, and so he um, values very much the fact that there's independent evolution of this creature um, and is just so excited by anything related to octopus. And so he has this footage of octopus filmed exhibiting these complex social behaviors where there's unique gestures in response to interactions, the rivals are fighting each other, there's tracking of mates in the area, and you can witness these cost-benefit analyses going on as they defend mates on site. Uh, and this is particularly interesting from an ethological point of view, because octopus are previously thought to be solitary creatures. Um, there's Samel Paris, which essentially means that their mother the, has a single reproductive cycle. It dies giving birth, and so, or directly after giving birth. And so there is no parental teaching of communication, and yet here they are exhibiting these social behaviors. Um, from a re-ID standpoint, octopus are indistinguishable from one another to a human. Uh, they have malleable form factor, they can change color, and they exhibit a property known as crypsis, which is the ability to camouflage with their background as a response of natural selection. And so this is um, an object detector, object detector in action. This is faster RCNN um, quantifying the bounding boxes around octopus um, from the site of Atlantis. And so you can see um, actual gestures, behaviors. This one here raised its arm. This one here is going to raise its arm. And there's this intruder, this non-resident on the site. So this guy here is beckoning. This guy here is beckoning. And then there's actually this response to this intruder as it's shooed away from the site. Um, 
so you can see the object detector work. And then there's actually this large flummox, this what is generally interpreted with intimidation when uh, an animal makes itself as large as possible happening at response to the intruder going away. So clearly there's some quote unquote societal interaction existing here. And so this is how the system works in practice. Uh, this is a bit of a contrived example, but I um, chose to keep it this way just for the explanation. We'll initialize a database um, empty of octopus individuals. We'll then use object detector to crop out instances of the different individuals on site. Um, a new individual will enter into the site. We will then compare every individual from the database to see whether or not that individual is considered similar or dissimilar. If the individual is considered to be dissimilar, which is represented on these values here in the bottom, the uh, octopus is then added to the database as a new octopus individual. If it's considered to be similar, then that's an octopus that we've seen before. Using this technique, we were able to do novel ethological discoveries, uh, such as the dominant or discovery of this dominant male on site. It turns out that octopus that swam across is the same octopus that is swimming across and defending the site on multiple occurrences. He's the same octopus that's corralling females that are trying to leave and the one that's repelling intruders. We're able to identify the female specifically that it mated with throughout the length of the video. We were also able to discover that the intruders are actually repeat offenders coming in from the site from multiple sides, which is uh, um, something that was previously unthought of. And so one, one thing we can see here is this is the number of excursions, the number of times an octopus uh, left the site. Essentially an O1, that one that we saw swim across, just dominates um, the activity on site. And so um, just to reiterate this, we can look at the Pearson correlation coefficient between O1's movement versus intruder attempts. And so movement is just movement around the site. And there's a very high correlation between O1's movement and intruders, less of a correlation with the other ones. We can consider excursions, which are when they totally leave the site and they chase someone away. And there's an extremely high correlation with intruder attempts and O1's excursions versus no correlation really between the other octopus. And then an interesting note is uh, mating attempts um, for O1 during this time has a slight negative correlation versus uh, a slight positive correlation for the other octopus on site. So when O1 was busy, um, the other octopus were a little bit more active. Um, and these are discoveries that were only made possible through my contributions to animal re-ID. And this is just one single case study. And so there, in conclusion, there's real world problems with current animal re-ID methods. They're expensive, they're laborious, they operate on suboptimal timescales like we talked about previously. And as a result, they're just too impractical to be frequent. Uh, and so we miss information that we could be collecting. Um, my work demonstrates a new technology for any application interested in animal re-ID from images and video. Uh, and one future application of this is real-time camera traps where the analysis is done on the camera themselves and they just send the classification results of the individual or the species from the field to research labs around the world, giving you a real-time analysis of what is going on within the ecosystems of interest. Um, and so with that, I would like to give special thanks to my supervisors, uh, Stefan Kramer, Stefan Lindquist, my committee, Graham Taylor, Andrew Hamilton Wright, um, Saul Greenberg, um, and Parks Canada for their involvement. Alex Zhuang, who is a high school student um, who emailed me literally one day and said, I love your work and I want to use AI to save the planet and help with conservation. And he's been just a motivating factor. And he's responsible for the entire chapter on the sonar images, collecting the data. I want to thank Sarah Beery, who's here, just because in my opinion, Sarah is the pulse of AI and conservation. And I'm just really happy to be able to call her my friend. Um, Operation Wallacea, they were, um, gave the sonar data they also gave a Peru data set, um, which I didn't include in my thesis, but hopefully has some real world application. And then all my friends and family that are here today. So thank you all so very much. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Well done in the face of some minor adversity there. I uh, have an update for everyone. Uh, Dr. Lindquist is indeed back with audio, um, which is great news. So uh, at this time, I'd like to see if there's any questions from the audience before we begin our formal examination. And if you have a question, uh, maybe just please, if you can use your hand up icon there, and then I can ask you to unmute. Uh, Noel Chalmers, you may need to unmute yourself. Howdy, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, you are. Cool. Uh, 
Well, thanks, Stefan. That was great. Uh, I learned a lot actually from this, and I'm, I guess I've got a couple questions I wanted to ask, and you may have touched them a little bit, but I guess I'm interested in a bit more detail on this. So okay. your uh, sort of pair selection and the, the problem of, of re-IDing something. My, my first instinct on that is to consider an autoencoder. Um, and it seems like the pair comparison has the flavor of that, especially when considering a Euclidean distance. Um, I guess, could you just expand on what, is that similar to an autoencoding strategy or is it different? And if it's different, why is the autoencoding not uh, practical here? Um, so an autoencoder will recreate the input image, right? That's kind of what the purpose of it is. I would say the similarity for an autoencoder is the fact that you're diluting the features to kind of a smaller hidden unit state at the center, where then you actually do the comparison based on those extracted features. You can think, um, so you have your massive array of pixels at the very beginning, and then you dilute it to what we would consider previously those feature extraction algorithms. And then it's based on those raw features themselves that we actually are able to do our similarity comparison predictions. Um, so an autoencoder doesn't actually do a direct comparison between two images. They're based on essentially con recreating that condensed feature extraction like procedure and then whatever you want to do from that state. And so traditionally it's to recreate um, your input. So for example, um, autoencoders are useful for transmitting information, for example, because then you can transmit less just those concentrated features and then reconstruct um, your input on the other side. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I guess I was I was kind of interested in in whether it's practical to to represent a, an individual animal that's been tagged in a lower dimensional latent space. But yeah, yeah, I, I guess that is sort of what your your pairwise comparison is doing. Yeah, so when you're doing that merger, let's say the Siamese network, when you're concatenating those features, though that is the lower represented latent space. That, so you are making a comparison on that. Yeah. Cool. And if it's all right with the chair, I had a second question. Sure, quick one. Um, I was kind of interested in the computational effort that's going to be required for this. Your comment at the end concluding that, well, maybe some of the data analysis can be done sort of just in time in the sensors themselves and transmitted. So how, how ex expensive is this computationally to do such a computation on, on the edge? Yeah, so it's kind of a trade-off on a whole bunch of things. It depends on the network itself, which then has the number of parameters. So there's specific networks that are designed to work on your smartphone, for example, like mobile net, um, which is actually one that I experiment with and report a lot for this exact reason um, because of the importance of being able to operate this on low powered devices. Um, and so you have this performance trade-off versus computational expense versus performance. Um, and so it's kind of a decision you have to make as a researcher, what trade-off, how, how long do these um, cameras operate within the wild? How frequently can someone go out and be able to replace the battery, check up on it and stuff like that. If it's, I'm gonna leave it out there for years, you'd wanna use the least um, power hungry model that you could, which would be something like mobile net. If it's something that you can visit more frequently and replace, you might want something that has higher accuracy like inception net or something like that. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I see two more questions, one from Stacy Scott and one from Sarah Beery. So uh, Stacy, why don't you go first and then we'll, we'll hear from Sarah. Sure, um, this is Stacy. Uh, thank you very much, Stefan. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, I actually did my uh, PhD in computer science at Calgary and Saul Greenberg was on my advisory committee. So I was very excited to see him in this presentation. Um, I have lots of questions, but I'll keep it to just a couple. Um, the camera trap, the Parks Canada study, we're using these camera traps. Uh, the, a lot of the images you showed were, of course, animals in different orientations coming towards the camera or going away from camera, going like sort of, um, you know, side to side on the camera. Are there any features of the camera traps that can help you um, identify which direction they're going in? Is there any features of these traps that besides just snapping images in terms of the um, motion sensors or anything like that that can help you sort of narrow down? Or is that something that you use in, in the models to help you be more accurate in your identification? 
Uh, two things come to mind of this. Uh, no matter what, it's still software at the end of the day that would be determining that. So if you wanted to consider travel direction, for example, you could look at pixel dissimilarity over like five shutters in a row and you could see, okay, there's actually been this like pixel dissimilarity pattern as this like animal moved across considering a static background. Um, in terms of just like the raw species classification, um, I did not uh, use um, the, the direction of the animal in any way, shape or form. Um, but it is, um, you can take advantage of the fact that there is a static background. And actually, Sarah here has really good work on using just that. Um, so there is, um, due to the niche domain of having a static camera at an image, there's ways to use um, machine learning to take advantage of that, considering kind of time series analysis. Yeah. Right, that makes sense. Um, and the other question I wanted to ask was at the very beginning of your presentation, you talk about, um, you know, the old fashioned way is obviously uh, for re-identification is very labor intensive um, and it involves a lot of human judgment bias. Um, how does bias come into your models in terms of, like you said, you labeled some odd thousand number of images yourself. So where does bias come in or in what ways does bias come in that still need work within your approach? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's it's everywhere, to be totally honest. You you can be biased in your distribution of classes. You can be biased in the way that you're labeled. You can be biases that some images show up in bright backgrounds versus other classifications show up in dark backgrounds. It is the ongoing struggle of machine learning to create models that are kind of remove these inherent biases from wherever you can. Um, in terms of the labeling of the individuals that I did, that was strictly the bounding box coordinates around species. Um, so I knew what the species were and I just had to draw the boxes around them. That was not individual ID. Um, so yeah, um, we tried to, the, the method I'm trying to um, propose here removes human judgment bias, but it now is subject to machine learning bias, which is now my job and the job of machine learning engineers to um, um, improve or mitigate or understand or at least report in whatever ways we possibly can. Great. Thank you, and really nice project. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, thanks, Stacy. Sarah? That was a great talk, Stefan. Um, sure. I wanna hear your solution for the camera <laughs> bias problem. You know that's like my most passionate subject, so. <laughs> yeah, um, so it's still a work in progress, but the idea essentially takes the um, chapter two's idea of creating synthetic images from um, the sonar um, examples and applies it to um, camera traps in general. So the idea is, and I have an example here, so thank you for asking. Uh, so there's an evolution on um, faster RCNN known as mask RCNN, where we're not, uh, it's a semantic segmentation task where we're identifying the per pixel classification of individuals. And so this is an example of it on camera trap data. And so the idea is to have a whole bunch of backgrounds of just the world, literally everywhere free of animals and take out these cropped representations and just paste them the same way that we did the sonar images where we're taking these components and resizing cheetahs and zebras and just just throwing them even random all over the place and then making the model learn on that and ideally that should make it background agnostic entirely uh tbd, TBD, TBD still working on it uh but that is um a next step that i think would be really cool so we like explicitly looked at this in in that synthetic data paper that i wrote um and yeah, you, you do get a huge boost in performance uh, just by really disambiguating those foreground and background pixels. So we're looking at extending the context to map to like mask RCN and that same like sort of context based approach for um, improving segmentation. But I don't think it's gonna fix it all the way specifically for scenarios where you maybe only have seen an animal at one camera. Um, so you just do not have that much variety in perspectives of the animal and so it's like you'll really help by disambiguating background and foreground, but I don't think it's going to fix the problem where you just don't have enough variety to actually learn the species. I, I would 100% so, agree, yeah. Other things we maybe could do to tackle that. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear we're on the same page. That's super awesome because we're literally working on this right now. So. Yeah, awesome. really cool. Okay, uh, thank you everyone for the question. So I think we'll, we'll get forward with the examination phase. Um, first of all, uh, Dr. Song, Dr. Schmidt, uh, Dr. Lindquist, if you're also there, I think it would be great if we could get the camera views of the examination committee.